All right, let's begin. Your next homework assignment is there. It builds on the uh, dissolved oxygen model that we were doing last time. Uh, if you'll remember, we uh, calculated the dissolved oxygen concentration some distance downstream. And uh, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be using Microsoft Excel, setting up the calculations in Excel so that you can calculate uh, what is the dissolved oxygen at certain points or as a function of time. And so it's kind of like automating the modeling process that you were doing. So that'll be due on Sunday. Uh, also as a reminder for the research paper, your first draft is due on Thursday the 12th of November. And uh, here's the sign-up sheet. Anybody else need to take a look at the sign-up sheet? Okay. So it's circulating around. Today we're talking about lake water quality, and we're going to do an in-class exercise related to lake water quality. Uh, it's majority of this is conceptual information, and so when we think about exams, for the next exam it'll be the same as the first. There will be two sections. There will be a conceptual questions and problem-solving questions. And so a lot of the conceptual questions may come from today's class lecture since uh, this is really heavy on the concepts. Any questions on the announcements before we move forward? All right. So let's take a look at a table. And I think you've probably seen this uh, same information in fluid mechanics. One of the things we talk about in fluid mechanics is uh, fluid properties. For example, density. And density of water changes as a function of temperature. And you have in class exercise 22, question 1. Take a look at this figure and just briefly summarize on the paper. Write down what's the relationship between water temperature and the density of water. Describe it on the paper. Write it down. No, I mean just to describe what's happening. Yeah. So for question one, just talk about what's happening. Maybe some of you are visual learners. Maybe you could just draw a little sketch to illustrate, illustrate the relationship or the trend. Another word for when it says, what is the relationship between water temperature and density? It's asking, what's the trend? What's the pattern? What do you see? And then once you've uh, briefly described what you see and what that pattern is, think about what causes it. That should be less obvious. What's happening is obvious. For anyone who knows how to read a table, what's happening is obvious. But why? Take a guess. Probably you don't know exactly why, but what's your opinion? All right, so let's think about mass. The units here are kilograms per cubic meter. So what it's saying is, if you have a cubic meter of water, like let's say, what would it be like if you had a container that was actually one cubic meter, one meter by one meter by one meter, and inside of here is water. So what this is saying is at 4 degrees Celsius, inside of this container is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. If the water is warm, if it's 40 degrees Celsius, how much mass can fit inside of that container? 
only a mass of 992.3 kilograms would fit inside that container. So what does that tell us about the fluid itself as a function of temperature? Okay, so as the water warms above four degrees Celsius, how would we fill in the blank? Let's use four degrees as an inflection point. That's where it seems to peak. That's the highest density is four degrees Celsius. So, well, it's four. I mean, it's rounding off that we're seeing here. Um, four is the most dense. So as we warm from there, as the water warms, what would you say to fill in the blank? As the water warms above four degrees Celsius, less mass can fit in the same volume. Okay, so that's one way to say it. Less mass fits into a certain volume. What's the other way to think about it? If we have a certain amount of mass, okay, the volume is directly proportional to the temperature. So elaborate. All right, so now you're getting on to part two of what causes it. And I think you're right there. The other, the other way to put it is that um, for a, a certain mass, so let's just say we have the same one kilogram of water the whole time. When we warm up a kilogram of water, what does it do? It occupies more space. For a certain mass, the volume increases. Okay, so as the water warms above four degrees Celsius, so we have this one kilogram, which is you know, roughly a liter. If you had a, a liter of water at four degrees Celsius, and then you heat the water up, it's actually going to swell. And so the volume occupied by that mass is larger at a warm temperature. All right, so now you are explaining part two. Now what's your theory on what's happening? Why does it swell as it warms up? Okay, yeah. All right, so he's using the analogy of a solid. We know from solid mechanics maybe that uh, as it warms, it swells. So think about a metal bar. And they have this problem in the rail industry. You know, long rails, when it gets really hot outside, those rails start to swell and they can buckle. Uh, they can slip apart because the rails get longer as the material expands. The same thing is true for liquids as it is for solids. Okay, kinetic energy. So the more temperature, the particles have more kinetic energy. They're vibrating, there's collisions, they're creating space. Exactly right. Let me bring on screen. You guys have said some of the same exact things that I had in my little write-up of it here. For part one, I said water becomes more dense as it cools achieving maximum density at four degrees Celsius. So I, I looked at it in terms of cooling in this written response rather than in terms of warming. So as you start with a high temperature and cool it off, it's getting more dense, more compact. And then the density decreases again gradually. So here's this inflection point. This is maximum density and then it starts going down again. And then when it's ice, then the density is much lower because we know ice swells quite a bit. That's why ice floats on top of water is because it has a lower density. And then part two, I was saying water molecules have more kinetic energy. They're moving around more. So as the water cools, the kinetic energy decreases and you can pack more molecules into the same space. Hmm, that's a good question. So what about why, when it becomes solid, we're taking even more energy. Why is it that the uh, molecules don't get even more compact? And um, for most things, that's true, but not for water. Water's kind of unique on, you know, it, uh, the bonds, the way that the molecules align when it becomes a solid actually occupies more volume. So water's an, an anomaly in that sense that the solid has a lower density than most solids do. It's just unique to the I guess the angle of the bonds in water.
All right, so this is going to be a big part of water quality. Believe it or not, a huge thing of lake water quality is all about temperature differences of water. So when we talk today about pollution and bacteria, all of the things kind of depend on what happens to water as it heats up and cools down. Keep that in mind. Let's talk about, first of all, what a lake looks like in the summer. In the summer, the air is warm, and so the water that's at the top of the lake is in contact with warm air, and so it's warm at the surface. There ends up being what's called a temperature stratification. And this word stratification just means layering. And during the summer, the top layer is called the epilimnion. Epilimnion just means the upper layer of something. Like uh, in your skin, your epidermis is the outer layer of your skin. So I think epi must mean the outside of. So the top layer is epilimnion. The bottom layer is called hypolimnion. And it's cool down there because it's far away from the hot air. That's where the, uh, the water is uh, closest to the soil, and soil stays a constant temperature through the year. And in between is this layer called the thermocline. Uh, but what we need to, if we accept that there's temperature stratification, then think about the other implications of that. The warm water has a lower density, and so that's why it's floating on top of the cool water. If we go back to the table, the warm water that's touching the hot air has a lower density. And so the warm water is floating on top of the cold water. And it's very stable because of those temperature differences. The cold water stays down here because it's the most dense. And the warm water floats on top because it's less dense. There's wind at the surface. The wind is blowing, and it kind of mixes up the water a little bit. But if the lake is very deep, then the wind doesn't have enough energy to mix it all the way to the bottom. Uh, the wind will only mix this upper layer if it's a relatively deep lake. The oxygen in the lake is high at the surface because remember we were talking about oxygen transfer last time and the oxygen comes back into water by filtering through the air through the surface of the water. And so here in the epilimnion there's a lot of oxygen but I say here that conditions can be anaerobic in the hypolimnion. The hypolimnion is that lower la the, the lower layer. So what I'd like you to think about in part three and part four is oxygen. Why is the oxygen high in the upper layer? And why is there a demand for oxygen in the bottom? So the problem at the bottom, there's actually, it's twofold. Number one, it's far away from where the oxygen is coming in. The oxygen is coming in at the surface. So that's part of the problem at the bottom of the lake. But then the other problem is, why is there demand for oxygen? There's something at the bottom of the lake that's consuming oxygen. Could be. Make your guess. Just write it down on the paper. I'm interested to see what sort of initial ideas you come up with. And then we'll talk about what's causing these effects. OK, let's talk about this. First of all, I got a good question as, I, as you were working. Somebody asked, what does anaerobic mean? Aerobic means with oxygen. Anaerobic means without oxygen. So uh, anaerobic actually can be a real problem. Because if conditions are anaerobic, then that means, uh, well, the effect of it is that there can be a really awful smell and toxic gases can form. We're going to talk a lot more about anaerobic conditions, but what you need to think of is it just means uh, without oxygen because it's all been used up. The fish can die during anaerobic conditions. Remember, there are a lot of uh, fish out there. In fact, most fish have to breathe the uh, oxygen from the water. Very few fish are able to get the oxygen from the air itself. So part three was asking, why are the oxygen levels high in the epilimnion? Anybody want to? answer what they had written on the page? Yeah. Good, right. Yeah, some would diffuse naturally. Even on a calm day, some air is getting, is filtering through this, uh, through the layer, the surface, um, 
they call it an interface, the, the gas liquid interface. Some is diffusing through that interface, but on a windy day, that makes even more come into the water because that will mix the oxygen rich water down and will bring up some of the oxygen poor water. Okay, so it's basically because of contact with the atmosphere for part three. What about part four? Think about at the bottom of the lake, I said there's something down there that's consuming oxygen. What is it? Okay. It could be fish. Now you said algae. You're headed on the right track. Actually, algae produce oxygen. It's a plant. And so plants will generate oxygen uh, rather than consume it while they're alive. So they're dead. Why would dead plants consume oxygen? Yeah? Bacteria are eating them. It's a food source. So there's a bunch of food down there, old leaves, dead fish, uh, algae that died and sunk to the bottom of the lake. There's organic material, and anytime there's organic material, no matter really what it is, there's going to be some kind of bacteria that's breaking it down. And so if you provide a bacteria with food, what else is it going to want? Oxygen. It needs both of those things, food and oxygen. And so there's organic material at the bottom of the lake, and so if we think in terms of mass balance, in mass balance, we draw a control volume around something. We say, let's study what's inside this box. And what are we keeping track of? We're keeping track of the accumulation of oxygen. Accumulation is in minus out. All right? So how does the oxygen come into the lake? Through the atmosphere. Where is the oxygen being consumed in the lake? It's being consumed by the bacteria at the bottom there. If the bacteria are using the oxygen so quickly, conditions can be anaerobic, which is bad. We don't want that. In the wintertime, so we've just been talking about what, what's the deal with a, uh, a lake in the summer. Warm water on top, cold water on bottom, because the warm water is less dense. In the wintertime, Let's say we're someplace cold enough that the lake freezes. So we have a layer of ice on top of the lake. And then the zero degrees Celsius water is less dense than four degrees Celsius water. Now that's strange. We have four degrees Celsius water on the bottom. Let's go back to our table. The most dense water can get is at about four degrees Celsius. That's the maximum density. And so the lake, the, the water that's on the bottom of the lake in the wintertime is actually the warmest. And then what's at the top of the lake is the cooler weather, uh, the cooler water. So during the wintertime, the, uh, the water that used to be warm was cooling off until it sinks. And we're going to look at a figure in just a minute that illustrates turnover. And that's what happens uh, when the warm water sinks to the bottom. There's something called the fall turnover, when the water that used to be warm at the top will sink to the bottom of the lake. And there's something called spring turnover, where the water at the bottom of the lake floats to the top. Those are big events in the lake during those turnover events. The thermocline is still our layer that's in between the epilimnion and the hypolimnion. And here's the illustration of turnover. In the summer, this figure is showing temperature as a function of depth. And so depth is on the vertical axis, and temperature is on the horizontal axis. And so let's look at summer and see if it makes sense to us. Does it make sense that the warm, the warm water is at the top? You know, of course, because in the summertime, the air is warm. So on the x-axis is temperature. So here you see it's saying four degrees. The coolest water will be at the bottom of the lake. And so it, on the x-axis, it's furthest to the right at the surface. So that means the highest temperature. Okay, does everybody see how this graph, what this graph is representing? Um, so there's a middle layer in between, and that's where the water temperature is changing rapidly. Here it's called the thermocline, that middle layer that's in between them. Some references refer to it as the metalimnion. 
So we know it means the same thing. In the fall, the air starts to cool off, and so that means that the water that's at the top starts to get colder and colder and colder, and suddenly there's a vertical line. And as soon as there's a vertical line, that means that all of the water can mix very easily. It used to be kept pretty isolated. The hypolimnian water stayed below, and it didn't mix very much with the epilimnian water. You can actually feel that if you swim in a lake. I'm going to show you some pictures in a minute of a lake that my parents have at their house, and you can swim in it, and sometimes like your chest will be warm and your toes will be freezing, depending on how deep down into the lake that water is. Right. Yeah, that's pretty unusual. If there's a hot spring at the bottom of the lake, there's going to be a lot of sort of like uh, thermal mixing. It sort of be like turbulence. Hmm. Probably because what would happen in a case like that, if you had a lake, if you had a lake with a hot spring in it, then that would. Uh, so let's say you have heat. A heat source here is going to rise, and it would sort of cause the water to mix like that. You know, there would be a, a rising plume. It would get up here, cool off, and then it would sink again. And so this would be a very effective way of circulating the, uh, of the oxygen down throughout the lake. So yeah. it's, it's always to the bottom. Um, that's the coldest that it'll be. Now, let's say that it's a really warm summer in a pretty shallow lake. It may not get all the way to four, but it's saying that four is the most dense. And so uh, it, it may not get that cold. It's not always four in the summer. Yeah. Four is the most dense. So sometimes a lake, depending on how deep it is, if it's only one meter deep, and we're talking about Yukon Territories, Canada, maybe it'll freeze the whole way. But if it is a 20 meter lake, then there may be a thick layer of ice, but then down below, four degrees Celsius water will be at the bottom of the lake. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yep. If it gets colder, then the ice layer will get thicker. And the warmer it gets, the ice layer gets thinner. All right, so this is showing the fall turnover. What you need to remember about the fall turnover is that's when the water is cooling and suddenly the stratification is gone. This is, a, I'm, I hope I remember this. What a great quiz question it would be if I said, explain stratification. That would be a great quiz question because stratification is the effect of the differences in temperature and the density. Stratification means layers. And so if I said, what is stratification? You could say, in a lake, there are different layers that have to do with the differences in temperature and density. At the top is the epilimnion where the water is warm and it's floating on top of the more dense, cool water down below, the hypolimnion. But then the stratification goes away that one day in the fall when all of the water is the same temperature, then the whole lake mixes very well. And then in the winter, there's more stratification because it's warm down beneath and cold on top. And then in the spring, as the ice melts and that cold water on the top begins to, uh, begins to warm up, it's really the spring turnover that is the most risky. Because if you think about it, all winter long, there's no oxygen getting into the lake. The fish have to slow down a lot. The bacteria are slowing down because the water's so much colder. But all winter long, there's no oxygen coming into the lake. And so there can be a real accumulation of, uh, of toxic gases. And so then in the spring, when finally the stratification goes away, you can sometimes, if you live near a lake, you can smell the day that there's fall turnover because all of a sudden, all of the gases that were stuck down at the bottom mix and start to get uh, vaporized up into the atmosphere. It comes back. So, and then after the spring, we're back to the summer again. But there is a day during the spring where there's no stratification when the water that's at the top that used to be cold in the winter, it's warming up again. And so then this graph where it's showing that it gets colder at the top it's shifting to the right as the uh, atmosphere warms.
the book goes into uh, the book does a nice job illustrating uh, seasonal variation. So that's one way to classify lakes. We classify lakes by how stratified they are, by how much oxygen they have in different layers, and uh, how cold the lake is, because that's going to affect the density of the water. Another way that we can analyze lakes is by how much light gets down into the lake. And so this is showing that the light will go down through a, a range of depths that we call the euphotic zone. And the euphotic zone is just the upper layer where sunlight is available. Plant growth occurs in the euphotic zone because plants need sunlight. There's not going to be any plants that are growing in the profundal zone because there's just simply not enough light there. The littoral zone is where the, uh, the euphotic zone coincides, the euphotic zone coincides with soil because uh, some plants need to attach to soil in order to grow. Some don't, like algae is just floating in the lake. And water lilies, uh, water meal, th that sort of thing. They float in the lake without any soil. But then a lot of plants like cattails and other things that you'd find in a, uh, in a wetlands have to have both sunlight and soil in order to grow. And so the littoral zone is that uh, coinc uh, coincidence of the euphotic zone with soil. And uh, profundal is just when there's less than 1% of the sunlight can penetrate. The benthic zone is wherever there is dead organic matter that's being decomposed. And we talked about how the bacteria are going to be consuming old plants and old fish, any kind of organic material, worms and microorganisms are going to be breaking it down. And uh, that's a pretty unpleasant layer. Like, it's like a thick murky black sludge that's at the bottom of some, some lakes. That's right. The, exactly. The, the bacteria don't need sunlight. And so the benthic zone can include both inside of the littoral and down below the light compensation level. So it can include any areas where organic material is present. Um, all right, so light is another way that we can classify lakes. We've talked about how you can classify lakes based on temperature slash density, how we can classify lakes based on the light. Now we can look at how much nutrients are in lakes. Now you use nutrients. Some of you maybe take vitamins. What are some of the common vitamins that people will, will take? DC. Vitamin C, vitamin D. What do they say vitamin D is good for? For your bones, vitamin C maybe will help you so you don't get a cold, they say. All right, so we have in mind what human nutrients are. Bacteria also require nutrients, and there's two main nutrients that they require, phosphorus and nitrogen. Those are the two nutrients that regulate their growth. They also need some trace minerals as well, but the, the things that are usually in the shortest supply that end up being the limiting factor for bacteria are phosphorus and nitrogen. So what this is showing, this model is showing that there's nitrogen in the atmosphere, and just like oxygen, nitrogen can come into the water from the atmosphere and it can leave through the atmosphere. Um, oxygen can come and go from the atmosphere, same with carbon dioxide, but um, these different categories here of producer, consumer, and decomposer is a producer is something that takes sunlight and turns it into energy, like a plant. We aren't producers. If we go lay out in the sun, that doesn't give us a full stomach, like it would for a tree. All right? We are consumers. And so a consumer is something that is either eating producers or eating other consumers. So that's what we do. We eat plants and animals. So we're consumers. So if you look, we are getting our nutrients from the food we eat, and the same is true for those that are in a lake. A consumer is getting nutrients like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus from the producers. Oxygen, the consumers are getting from atmosphere or from the oxygen in the water. Decomposers are things that break down waste products and they recycle the nutrients. There's
the atmosphere is a sink and source of nitrogen, oxygen, but not phosphorus. Remember I said the two main nutrients that um, bacteria and plants need is nitrogen and phosphorus. And if you look at this diagram, nitrogen can come from the air, but phosphorus isn't in our atmosphere. Phosphorus is a nutrient that has to be added some other way, like uh, from wastewater streams. Or if you're growing crops, you have to add phosphorus to the ground in order to get the plants to grow the most quickly. And so um, one of the big pollutants that we have to regulate in lake water quality are nutrients. What do you think happens if we put in lots and lots of nutrients? What will happen to this cycle? This is a life cycle. The, the producers take the sun and turn it into energy. The consumers take the energy from the producers, go through their life, and then they die. And the decomposers break down uh, and, you know, whatever whatever uh, material is left over from the consumers and they liberate. So they take the phosphorus and nitrogen that was in the cell tissue of the consumers and these decomposers turn it back into a dissolved form. So it's a cycle. It goes around and around in a loop. So if we add more nutrients, someone was going to take a guess. What do you think happens if, if I was to pour a bag of fertilizer into a lake? The fertilizer has nitrogen and phosphorus. What is that? What's going to happen in the lake if I add a bunch of nutrients? Okay, you're right. Oxygen levels will drop, and why is that? An algae bloom. Exactly. You'll stimulate the producers. These producers, they need sunlight, but what else do they need? They need the nutrients. And so there can only be a certain amount of algae in a lake. And the amount of algae in a lake is limited by how much nutrient is available for the algae. So if you add a bunch of extra phosphorus and nitrogen, then all of a sudden those producers are going to have plenty of sunlight, plenty of nutrients, and so it's going to spread like a bloom. Here's a picture of a beautiful mountain lake. Just by looking at it, I don't have to do a chemical analysis. Just by looking at it, I can tell you there's not very much phosphorus and nitrogen in that lake. Why do you think I'm saying that? Yeah? It's clear. Yeah, this water is clear. Now, there's two reasons this is clear. One of them is because of what I just said. There's not much nutrients in here, so we don't see algae anywhere. There's no algae in this lake. The other reason it's clear is related to the uh, soil type in this area. You know, we, there's, uh, we can see there's rocks. And at the bottom of this lake is sand. But there's not very much clay in this area. Even if there wasn't algae, it's possible for a lake to look very murky. And what do we call that when a lake doesn't pass light? Turbidity. Yeah, so turbidity is different from algae. This doesn't have either. So it's a beautiful lake to look at because it's not turbid, meaning there's not suspended clay particles floating around. And it also lacks algae. So that's a nice lake. What a beautiful picture. Phosphorus will stimulate algae growth, and uh, the amount of phosphorus limits biological activity. So if you add phosphorus externally, it will make a lake more productive. Now this word, productivity, when we talk about lake water quality, productivity is actually a bad thing which is kind of different from the way we usually use the word. Normally, when we say the word productivity, we think, well, if you're productive, that's good. It's good to be productive. But not in a lake, because we don't want the ecosystem to get cycling too quickly, because then it'll mean there's algae everywhere. If the algae are growing too much, then when they die, they settle to the bottom. And what happens to dead algae at the bottom of a lake? The bacteria are going to break them down, and the bacteria are consuming oxygen. So actually, what we've done is if you add too much phosphorus, too much nitrogen, you can cause there to be a lack of oxygen at the, do at the bottom of the lake because there's going to be decaying organic material at the bottom of the lake. And bacteria, or the, the decomposers, are going to be consuming oxygen as they decompose that organic material. So eutrophic, this word here, eutrophic, is a designation we give to lakes that have too many nutrients. They're out of control. There's so much nutrient in the lake that the cycle between producers, consumers, decomposers is going very quickly 
and a eutrophic lake has characteristics of not enough dissolved oxygen at the bottom. So here you can see plants are floating at the top. This waterway has a lot of algae growing in it. Here's a, an up-close look at a lake with lots of algae. It's not as nice. Here's the lake that's at my parents' house. This is in Ohio, where they live. And uh, they have a lake on their property. And here you can see there's some algae on the lake. And it drives my dad crazy when the algae are on that lake. You know, when you buy a house next to a lake, you don't want to have your view be disgusting algae like this, right? So why is there algae in the lake? Phosphorus, yeah? Phosphorus, yeah, you can't quite see it, but here where the mouse is, uh, there's a farmer who's growing soybeans and corn. So the farmer puts down fertilizer, and then it rains, where does that fertilizer go? It goes into the lake. So that's the reason why algae grow in this lake, is there's too many nutrients. And here's a lake, here's a picture of that same lake when it's raining. Uh, when, when, the not, when the sun isn't out, the algae sink to the bottom. But when there's sun, they'll float because they start to emit oxygen, and that oxygen sort of makes them more buoyant. It gets trapped in the little, uh, little spines. So if the wind is blowing, it'll blow all the algae to one end of the lake, and so you don't see it as much. So it's a problem that seems like it's coming and going, but the main issue is the nutrients. You know, even though you think, well, there wasn't algae yesterday, it might be that the algae aren't floating, or it could be that the algae are on one end of the lake, but really it all comes back to the nutrients that are being applied by the farmer upstream of the lake. Here's an aquatic plant that's called cattails, and these cattails grow only where there is enough light and where there's soil. They won't grow in the middle of the lake. They can't float like algae can. Um, you can add air pumps to try and reduce the amount of stratification in a lake. And uh, this is a ditch that I dug. It was exhausting. They have a lot of tree roots. And so I was putting in um, these air stones, similar to like in a fish tank. Like your fish have to have oxygen, right? So you can add an air stone into a lake to try and break down the stratification if you're worried there's too much organic material at the bottom of the lake. So that's what we did. We put in those uh, aerators to try and make a lake so that it's breaking down the nutrients. An oligotrophic lake is that nice mountain lake that we looked at that has very low productivity. It's the opposite of eutrophic. So oligotrophic lake is one that is not enough nutrients to support algae growth. Here's another picture of a different oligotrophic lake. If you're going to go swimming, the oligotrophic lake is the one that looks more refreshing. Of course, it looks like we're up in the mountains. I see snow, so that water's probably also pretty cold. Who knows? Mesotrophic is in between eutrophic and oligotrophic. It means there's some nutrients, and so there will be some algae, but it's not yet out of control. It's not enough algae that the bottom of the lake is covered in a layer of organic material. And of course, eutrophic is that one that we don't want. It's where there's too many nutrients, a high productivity, and in warm weather, when the bacteria are breaking down organic material really quickly, a eutrophic lake can have anaerobic conditions. So there's a relationship between nutrients and oxygen. Uh, phosphorus itself isn't consuming oxygen in the lake, but the bacteria will use phosphorus as their nutrient, and then they'll uh, use oxygen as a, an electron acceptor as they, break down, uh, as they break down organic material. This is kind of thought of as a proof. This is a proof that phosphorus is what limits algae growth in a lot of places. And this is a graph that shows how much phosphorus is in a lake versus how much chlorophyll. And the amount of chlorophyll that's in water is proportional to the amount of algae in the lake. And so what this is showing is if you have more phosphorus, there's going to be more algae. There's going to be more plant life if you provide this nutrient. Algae need lots of things. They need water, sunlight, CO2, nitrogen, but it's the phosphorus that's the limiting factor. They can only grow as quickly as the amount of phosphorus that's provided to them. One source of phosphorus besides um, fertilizers 
can be um, birds. Like a goose can actually bring a lot of phosphorus to a small lake. Um, and so one of the ways that you, if you're a lake owner, you have to control phosphorus is by trying to chase off the geese. They have like these noise-making guns. You can shoot at the geese and you're not actually trying to hurt them or anything. It just makes a big noise and then the geese will fly away. So some of the ways that you manage lake water quality is try and reduce the amount of inflow of phosphorus, like controlling fertilizer from agriculture. One of the big sources for phosphorus used to be in detergents, like soaps. Uh, laundry detergent that you'd use for your clothing, dish detergent that you'd use for, um, for the washing machine, what used to be loaded with phosphorus because phosphorus helps to make water more soft and so it, the things get more clean if there's lots of so phosphorus. Sometimes nutrients can come from wastewater or septic tanks, which are tanks that hold wastewater on a residential property. Um, sometimes lakes have phosphorus just because of mineral deposits that are under the lake, like from rocks. And that's an uncommon thing, but if there are mineral deposits in the rocks, then there's really nothing you're going to be able to do about that. It's just sort of naturally occurring. It is possible to eliminate some of the phosphorus presently in the lake. You to do that, you have to somehow get the phosphorus out of the lake, either by dredging the sediments with uh, like a bucket loader, getting the sludge out of there, or anytime you catch a fish from a lake and you take the fish out of the water, the fish has some phosphorus in its, uh, in its flesh, and so you're getting phosphorus out of the system by removing fish. It's also possible to use an air stone, like this is showing a diffuser. That's at the end of those air tubes that I was showing when I dug that ditch. I, I went out in a little rowboat and I dropped these air diffusers into the lake. And what that'll do is it'll give oxygen to the water so that the material that's at the bottom of the lake can be broken down more quickly. So you can get rid of the, uh, get rid of the organic matter at the bottom. Another way to control algae, if you can't control the phosphorus, you can control the algae. So it's, the algae is the symptom. You can control the, the symptom by adding a chemical called copper sulfate. And um, it, it kills the algae, but it's relatively safe for humans. You can add it directly to a water source that you're using for drinking water, and it, wa it won't cause trouble. Um, it can last for a long time, depending on what form the uh, copper sulfate is, but it's relatively expensive. Um, it's not toxic to humans, but copper sulfate will be toxic to fish. And, yeah? No, algae is alive. When it, when it dies, it sinks to the bottom. But like the green stuff that you see floating in the lake, yeah, that's a living, it's a plant, basically. A, it's a plant that's floating in the water. And so what this will do is it'll kill the plant. Um, and part of the problem is that if you kill the algae, then other things can grow in its place. There's um, the algae, if you're using copper to control algae, then there are some zooplankton in water that would naturally break down algae. And so you're killing the thing that would naturally be eating the algae. So it's sort of a temporary solution. There are other chemicals in the market. Like uh, here's just some of the brand names of chemicals that are available and what kinds of plants they control. I don't think this is included in your notes because it's just provided sort of uh, for informational purposes that you know, there are things out there that can be used to control lake water quality. One of the things that we, wanted to, we need to go over today is the effect of acid rain on lakes. Uh, we all know that acid rain comes from hydrogen sulfide in the atmosphere and it forms sulfuric acid. Um, when you burn coal that has sulfur in it, then it gets up into the atmosphere and this is the reaction. That the SO2, after combustion, forms with water after an intermediate reaction and forms H2SO4. This is sulfuric acid. Nitrogen oxides will also form acid rain, uh, nitric acid, and that's most commonly from vehicle exhaust rather than from power plants. This reaction comes from burning coal. This reaction comes from internal combustion, from burning gasoline. Either one of them can cause acid rain. Acid rain can really move around uh, pretty far. It can go from country to country. It's a pollution uh, that, uh, for example, in Great Britain, when they were burning lots of high sulfur coal, 
than in Sweden they were seeing acid rain as the wind, would, the wind patterns would take that smoke from Great Britain to Sweden. And uh, the same thing is true in the United States, in the northeastern part of the United States, like New York and Pennsylvania. All of the pollution would be blown to the north into Canada. <laughs> so that was sort of like uh, an environmental effect that's more of on a regional or even a global scale. I want to show you a figure of uh, both what can happen from acid rain and where acid rain is a problem. Here is some pictures of trees. It looks like they burned down, but they didn't. It's actually contact with acid that caused all this damage. It looks like maybe a forest fire, but it's uh, just the fact that the plant material is being attacked by the low pH in the rain. It can have an effect on lakes. Uh, this lake doesn't have any sort of plant growth in it, and we're thinking, oh, that's great, fantastic, because we don't like plant growth in the lake. But the problem is it doesn't support fish life anymore either. And so it, it's sort of a, a dead lake that used to be a relatively nice one. So here is a picture that's showing in the United States the pH of uh, rainwater. So this is precipitation. When it rains, what is the pH of the water that comes from the atmosphere? Well, what it shows is in the eastern United States, the pH of the rainwater is lower than in the west. Now, maybe some of you have never been to the United States, but what do you know about the eastern U.S. compared to the western U.S.? Where are most of the people? Do you know that? Yeah, over here is where most of the population density is very high. So like New York, Massachusetts, Washington, all the big cities that we think of are over here on the east coast. And so that's where they're using a lot of coal for power generation. So the reason why the pH is low on the eastern United States is because that's where they're burning more coal. On the western United States, there's, the population density is much lower. There are fewer people there. And so the pH isn't affected by environmental pollution as much. This other map is showing, unfortunately, a lot of the lakes that are poorly buffered are up here in Canada, where the pollution is getting pushed from the, west, from the eastern United States up into Canada. And so it's sort of like uh, um, we talked about buffers and alkalinity. These lakes that are shaded in dark gray here have a low alkalinity, and so they're very sensitive to acid rain. So that's all we've got for uh, lakes today. Let's just take one last look at the announcements before we go. Your homework assignment number nine is due on Sunday. And I hope that you're thinking about the research paper and started uh, gathering some information for part one because that uh, deadline of November 12th will be here before you know it. Have a good one. I'll see you on Thursday.